thanks everyone for joining. I'm Sam Giel from ChinaDialogue.net. We're a bilingual website based in London and Beijing, focused on environment and climate change, with a special focus on China. Um, and we've focused on all kinds of issues around the transition um, over the past decade or so, and we'll be getting into some of that in the discussion. I'm really happy to be joined here by, on the end, Matthew Baldwin from the European Commission, and specifically DG Move, its uh, Directorate for Mobility, Transportation, uh, by Maria Kailonen from uh, the Finnish Left Alliance, a former transport minister herself and an MEP, uh, by Sharon Masterson from the OECD's uh, International Transport Forum, um, and on my right by uh, Monica Mikatz uh, from RIMAC Automobili, which um, is a leader in electric mobility. And I think it's important that we're discussing this this morning, uh, given that at the same time now in Bonn, we have the um, Fiji-hosted um, annual meeting of the UN Climate Framework, happening, the first one to happen since Trump announced his planned withdrawal from the Paris Agreement. And this comes at a moment when, you know, even if countries are to meet their pledges under the UN uh, Climate Agreement, the so-called NDCs, we still don't have the, the level of ambition needed to reach 1.5 or 2 degrees. We're probably heading, according to UNEP, for something like a 3 degree world, even with the pledges we have. And with Trump's announced withdrawal, we're in an even more dire situation because of the lack of leadership, because of the sort of power vacuum that provides in terms of national state level leadership, um, you know, as seen, say, underpinned by the Xi Jinping Obama agreement at the end of 2014, um, that's needed to really raise ambition so that we can reach 1.5 or 2 degrees. So what it opens, I suppose, is the need for alternative centers of power, be that subnational centers of power, municipal governments, sectors like aviation or shipping or transportation, um, for innovation from firms, and all these, these uh, kinds of questions around where innovation can come from. And transport is you know, it's fundamentally important. It, it represents some 23% of energy-related uh, emissions, about 14% of total global greenhouse gas emissions, and some 95% of all energy uh, used in transportation is still fossil fuels, uh, diesel and gasoline. So with that context, I thought I'd allow our speakers to introduce particularly how they're helping that innovation around transportation to help regain some of that momentum on climate that, that we're seeing potentially slipping in the context of the Trump withdrawal and, and, and the Paris Agreement not having that kind of adequate level of ambition, and how they've been help to kind of advance that in their work, um, maybe starting with, with Monica. So Remake Automobili is well known because of a supercar that we produce, Concept One. But the supercar is just one part of the business that we do. We are actually a technology company and we produce all of the technology for the supercar and we supply that technology to many other clients in the automotive industry. Some of the projects that are public is that we work with uh, Aston Martin, we work with Koenigsegg, we work with Jaguar Land Rover and many others in the industry, even some of the mainstream manufacturers and we are actually helping them to go electric. Sharon? Yeah, thank you Matthew. And I think it's an important question that you've raised about how transport can actually contribute towards um, the COP agreement and towards the Paris agreement. I think in terms of the leadership, it's important to remember that where there's a void, sometimes that void can be filled. And we've seen a lot of movement recently in different countries, China, for example, taking the lead very much in what's happening at the moment in terms of climate change, announcing a ban on gas and, and diesel cars along with France, Norway and the UK in the last couple of weeks and months. Um, and again, the cities in, in the US, for example, Mike Bloomberg saying that, you know, we are committed to this agreement, we are committed, we will look with the cities at what we can do and with the industry, so bringing all the players in, not just the national government, to be a part of this. And I think that's absolutely key to achieving our goals here. At the International Transport Forum, after the COP21 and the Paris Agreement, we said, look, this is fantastic, there's a huge momentum here, but we need to bring this from being uh, commitments on paper to actual tangible results. And we need to do that without hesitation. 
So we started what we call the Decarbonising Transport Project, engaging all of the actors of the transport sector. So not, not just our member governments, and just a little, little uh, introduction to who we are, we're an intergovernmental organisation with 59 member countries, including all of the big uh, emis emitters. So our members include the 35 members of the OECD, but also more broadly than that, China, Russia, India, etc. So working with our member countries, working then also with the industry, so with the members of our corporate partnership board who are very, very engaged in this, and also with the multilateral de development banks to reach more further than our member countries, industry associations, so car manufacturers associations, etc., on this big global project to bring us to the next stage of negotiations in 2020. Maria? Uh, would you be able to talk just a little bit about how you're trying to advance this aim of, of kind of pushing forward to a decarbonisation, the transition in, in your work? Mm -hmm. us, us politicians need to start the new kind of thinking, new kind of dialogue together. And I think the first thing is to change the thinking between two years. And it's the most difficult thing for us as politicians. Because usually we want to make new legislation and not enabling things happen more, even we are thinking that we are doing good things. And I think uh, we have to be very innovative when we are checking out the taxation or insurance issues or, or how, we, how we change the subsidies policy. And, uh, uh, what I uh, I have had a good I advice which I want to share with you, and I think it's best for us politicians to understand to make the enabling legislation. Uh, those who say it can't be done should not interrupt uh, those doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think I think it's the best advice what a politician can get. So we make things happen not be the back, back up or, or, or those who are saying that, okay, it can't be done. Mm -hmm. It can, if there's a will. Matthew? Yeah, well, I think it's a great question you're asking, because I think we all know where we want to get. Everyone on this panel, on the EU side, we want to be 60% lower by 2050 and on track for zero. Um, but transitions are difficult. Transitions are expensive. Transitions have winners and losers. Um, and we can get stuck if we're not careful. So very much more specifically, what are we doing about this in the European Commission? I'd like to pick out three themes to drive decarbonisation forward. One is digitalisation. This can make transport safer, more efficient, both for freight and for passengers, and enhance the capacity of our existing networks. Secondly, investment. We've already mentioned how expensive it can be. If we just get to 7% electrical cars by 2025, that means a 4 billion annual investment from 2020, plus 1.5 billion investments to do the backbone of um, infrastructure uh, for, 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 for charging. And finally, people put users at the heart of the transport services, not just by promoting safety, which is a good and traditional role, but by allowing choice, allowing users to shape how the transport services will evolve in the future. Mm. And so Matthew, Maria talked about you know, supporting those who are actually doing it, who are really sort of moving things forward. I mean, from your perspective, who is then? I mean, wh wh what, um, what do you think is most contributing to decarbonisation of the transport sector as it stands? Who, who's really leading at, uh, as, we, as it stands currently? You mean by different sectors? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it has been a, a, an amazing change. I mean, your, the figures you gave at the start, Sam, are, are horrific about the role of transport in causing emissions, a quarter and growing. And I think we have to face up to that. Cars are the most obvious culprit. I think they're now at 20% of all emissions. Um, and uh, the, the quickest way to lose your job in the commission is to announce things before they're announced. But um, I hope in the coming days we'll be coming with a very interesting package of new measures on things like CO2 standards, um, alternative fuels infrastructure, and so on. But let me pick out two sectors which have up to now not done very much, to be honest. First, it's aviation, where uh, despite all the predictions that nothing would ever happen, in 2016 at ICAO, the International 
uh, aviation organization under the UN uh, auspices. We've now got agreement to move forward with global market-based measures, starting with the monitoring and reporting of CO2 emissions, and then offsetting emissions that exceed those from 2020. Baby steps, but steps in the right direction. And on the maritime side, rising fast from, I think, about 2.5% of emissions at the moment. Again, we need a global approach to deal with the global industry. And we're starting with data collection there and, and moving forward with a, uh, towards a roadmap with initial CO2 reduction commitments to be agreed next year. Um, and finally, the, if you like, the poster child, the poster child uh, in terms of uh, good practices on decarbonisation, the railways, they've got to look to themselves as well because with all the high-speed track that's going in, uh, and if we don't manage to uh, decarbonise the electricity supply, we might find that trains, our friendly green trains, are uh, rising towards the top of the list. So what we want to do is get, if you like, a sort of competition going between the different transport modes to who can decarbonise most efficiently and most effectively. Briefly on aviation and shipping, the sort of bad boys of, of, of the sort of transport sector in terms of emissions traditionally. I mean, how far can we really go while these sectors are not included in, for example, the UN climate framework? And, and on reporting emissions, uh, one of the big challenges has been the lack of transparency, you know, particularly in, say, in the maritime industry. It's very, very difficult to, to, to get that kind of level of transparency. How, how are we really going to produce that? And do we need them to be included in these bigger kind of UN frameworks? Well, I think we'd all like to see that happen, but let's work with the practical. The fact that they're not included puts the onus squarely on ICAO, on IMO, to take action. And I'm very pleased to say that that is now starting to happen. I'm proud at the amount of leadership that Europe has offered. Um, uh, but I, I think there has been a sea change, including on the maritime side, if you'll excuse the pun. Um, and secondly, how do we do that, given the lack of transparency? Well, let's start with the data. Let's collect the data. Let's be able to look at emissions within a common framework. And that, I'm, proud, I'm pleased to say, is now happening. Can I maybe jump in? Mm. Because um, I know the technical challenges. We are not only supplying automotive industry. We had various different talks uh, in aviation sector, in maritime sector. and. There is still a big problem and challenge. Um, how can you have electric plane? Because it's not the same with a car. With a car, once you started the rolling, you don't use so much energy. But with a plane, you have like a resistance of the wind all of the time. And you, your battery needs to be bigger. Your battery needs to be better. And I think that's one of the technical challenges that also aviation sector will go forward if we start to have incremental changes in the battery cell technology. And if that improves, then maybe aviation sector could easily jump in and move forward. How do we underpin and drive that incremental change and indeed th those breakthroughs that are needed in technology? So we have experience, like I have been with a company from 2011. And from 2011 up to now, uh, basically n not much changed in the battery cell level. Uh, that's the biggest problem. I'm not sure what is the right way, but I have discussed with um, um, with some governmental bodies in America, and they have this program. Um, it's not a grant; it's actually a award. So they they grant a huge award to someone who is solving a bigger problem, a huge problem, and then they have many companies competing to solve this bigger problem and they says it works actually i'm not sure if they're doing it uh, because on a battery cell level but that's maybe something that could strive us forward because all of the changes that are happening and you can read about it there is uh, incremental change in the battery technology it will change our life but that's all on a laboratory le level it's actually not going into the production and that's the biggest problem it, it points to that role that governments have traditionally played actually in, in bolstering, underpinning, even being the sort of entrepreneurs in pushing forward um, technology deployment and breakthroughs and so on. Matthew, you wanted to jump in? Well, I just wanted to say uh, you're dead right about the battery. And again, watch this space for more announcements coming this week on, on that from us. But also, let's not forget broader alternative fuels in terms of the infrastructure that needs to be rolled out, investment that needs to be made in hydrogen and other things. We've, we're not going to be able to tackle this decarbonisation problem with just one golf club. We've got to swing at everything. Looking at 
electric mobility, I suppose one of the really important things actually, and, and, and indeed with batteries, is the scale of manufacturing of batteries that's been bolstered by a sort of shift in the modes of, modes of transport around the world. In cities like China, you've got all kinds of really creative, very demand-driven things happening. Um, I mean, I wanted to talk actually about beyond the shift in technology, the shift in kind of models, business models, ownership models, so on, that's, that's occurring here. I know, Sharon, that your organization has worked on these sort of, uh, on the shift towards the sharing economy, the kinds of ways in which, uh, in which actually we may have to think quite differently about what transportation looks like in cities of the future. Um, I mean, w w what do you see sort of happening in that space and where do you see the, the, the kind of real disruption? I think the points that have been made uh, just by the former two speakers are very valid on the technologies and renewable technologies. But we've looked at what other things can bring. So not just the technologies and renewables, but also there are other things that we can do right now. So we see disruption primarily in the business models and transport. Um, not at all uh, something that's about to stop very, very soon and something that can deliver results immediately. So we've done a lot of work on looking at what shared mobility can deliver. And shared mobility is something that's technologically possible right now. We modeled actually the city of Lisbon in our first shared mobility study and took all of the trips that were happening in the city and transferred them to shared vehicles. And the results were uh, phenomenal. Uh, we looked at something like minus 34% in, in emissions. I mean, that's huge. Also changing cityscape in terms of the parking required um, and just basically making it a more livable city. So we think that the disruption that's happening now, we should be looking at what's happening in the startup sector. We should look at what's happening in the business models. And to a point that Maria addressed earlier in terms of regulation, one of the things that we believe is very, very important for this to foster, and Finland is a fine example of what's exactly, happened here, yeah. is opening up and having more fe flexible regulation. So having regulation fit for purpose and doing yep. what it's supposed to do, but being as flexible as possible to allow innovation to foster. And the transport code is, is, is a great start in, in that. I mean, this points to the need for a sort of integrated approach, right? You have to think at the level of city planning, the level of energy policy. After all, if you've got uh, electric vehicles on the road that are largely fueled by fossil fuels, you haven't really, you're not really challenging the decarbonisation uh, issue, even if you are helping to mitigate urban air pollution. So it all points to actually to the need for, I'd say, national legislators and lawmakers and so on to take a lead. I mean, Maria, you're a former transport minister. What's your experience of, of uh, driving forward that transition and, and what do you think is the proper role of, of lawmakers in that? It's not easy. It's not easy way to go because uh, it's somehow you need to open up for the other politicians the thinking that we are really reinventing the whole economy, and we need to change for the backbone, the land using, and how we are motivating people the smart land use at first first point and smart housing because it affects so much in the transport sector, and I think. Um, when we are speaking about uh, this system and how we should change it, we should have a, a dialogue with the customers all the time. Because I think the biggest problem in policy area in, in transport sector is that we don't have a dialogue with our customers. And actually, there's the cases in political level that we don't even know who is the customer and who should be, uh, should be take care of and how. And I think uh, basically we as the policymakers, we think that, okay, we know what the people need, what they want, uh, what they are scared of, or what they don't want to share, for example, with the data issues. And usually when I'm asking from people, they are thinking totally differently than us the politicians. And I think uh, we have lost the connection for, for, uh, to the to the basic level, those needs which are very important for the people in their daily life. It's, uh, it's a great point. It's very easy for sort of technocrats to sit around and, and, and plan what the future of transportation looks like, but without thinking actually about the demand side in quite a serious way that takes into account that our, our modes of transportation are cultural objects, they're embedded in our daily lives and so on. We, we, we don't really... Uh, it's very difficult to grapple with. I mean, uh, Matthew, you wanted to come in on that yeah, point. Yeah, I, I just, well, maybe we're all agreeing too much. Uh, I very much agree with the last two speakers. But particularly as urban areas continue to grow, 
I think it's really incumbent on the European and the national authorities to really get that dialogue going at the local level and indeed to leave things to the local level where we can, exactly as Sharon was saying, which is why we're encouraging these things called sustainable urban mobility plans. They're not very attractive sounding sumps to, to try to kind of encourage each uh, locality to, to, to develop its own wider mobility strategy. But look, you know, if you're sat in a traffic jam of electric vehicles, it's a green traffic jam and it's still holding things up. Congestion costs up, uh, cost us in Europe roughly 1% of our GDP a year. So we, you know, at, at the same time as we decarbonize our electricity supply and our transport, we've got to be very focused on encouraging, encouraging, not forcing, encouraging that modal shift to public transport, to walking, to cycling, uh, including for freight in cities. So some very, very interesting ideas going on for cycle freight. Well, sort of cycle freight and, and these kinds of different um, new emergent innovative models point actually to, I suppose, the, the capability for newly built cities, for cities in the developing world and so on, to actually leapfrog mm. and to avoid the sort of lock into carbon intensive forms of transportation that we've seen in, in, in other uh, in other national contexts. I know that at the OECD you're working not with only with OECD ministers but also with countries like China and India. I mean, are, are they having those conversations about how, for example, they can tackle air pollution, uh, energy security, all these kinds of issues by actually leapfrogging now and, and, and planning their cities and their transportation systems in radically new ways? Absolutely, Sam. Um, and looking at this, we're talking about urbanization and that is going to happen a lot over the coming years and in particularly in China where we will see quite a number of new cities actually over the next uh, number of Two years weeks. <laughs> yeah and we're looking at um, with them on what they can do and they're very very interested and, and just let me point to one thing when we talk about electric mobility I think we can forget that there are a lot of electric two and three wheelers actually in many areas of the world right now and not just sure. electric cars we need to consider that as well as a viable option there is huge potential on greenfield sides to build cities for tomorrow. So not build them around the car the way we have done historically, but to build them for new types of transport, for example, the shared mobility or other types. And this is something that they are actively looking at and something that we're always available at the ITF to speak with the countries about and speak with the cities about and see how what we know at the ITF and what our member countries and cities know and how we can spread best practice in this so, so that they can leapfrog. So we have learned a number of lessons on various different things that we think would be very, very valuable to other countries that are not quite there yet. Mm. Monica, yeah. I think that question, are we going electric, is already decided. Uh, it's just a matter of time. I think the next big step is actually going autonomous. Uh, and not only possessing autonomous cars, but as you mentioned, like having a car sharing with autonomous vehicles and that will completely reshape our world. We will have to think about new jobs that will come in because many people will lose their job because of that change that is going to happen. And also then if we think about the infrastructure, of course you don't need an infrastructure supporting everybody having electric car. Mm. Yeah, and I'll just jump in on that because that's exactly right. And what's very important in these areas is the transition. And I think this is what we're talking about today. So transitioning to something like um, autonomous vehicles is something we've looked at in terms of driverless trucks. Of course, there's been huge discussion on the impacts of labor uh, on that. And we at the ITF have looked at managing the transition to driverless trucks. So bringing together the automa automotive manufacturers and trucks, but also bringing together the International Label Organization and the IRU, the International Road Transport Union, in dialogue, because dialogue is very, very important to what we're doing and how we're going to achieve things, in dialogue to see how can we do this and what is the best option and how can we work forward together on this. Um, I'd be interested to hear your perspective on that, Maria. As, as a lawmaker who's thinking about the impacts, the social impacts of, of this mm. sort of shift to automation um, and this sort of very large scale shift, how are you thinking about how to, uh, I suppose, uh, well, not only mitigate the worst social effects, but also uh, embrace potential, you know, progressive kind of um, spillovers and so on that this might create in terms of cleaner cities or, or better jobs. I have tried to keep my legs down in the ground when I'm thinking about digitalization and robotization. 
I know that in transport sector, in aviation and uh, in maritime sector, it will go very fast forward. But uh, I don't actually believe that in, in real basic cars, in the urban areas, in the cities, the progress won't be so fast as we are thinking right now. Mm. Because uh, why I uh, put it r right now, in this moment like this, I visited in California, in Silicon Valley, last week, and uh, there I realized that, okay, it's coming in step by step, but not with that huge leap, which is uh, kind of thinking and speaking out loud right now. So I think those effects, social, for the uh, uh, working places, for uh, uh, people, people's daily life, the change won't be so huge in a short time. It will be if you are checking for the, for the next, uh, next period, next uh, century, the new generations can live in total, total different, different life. But I think uh, in, in urban areas, the change will take a time and uh, how it changes also the infra, because it needs a huge amount of money also. So if we want to change things with a longer period, we need to uh, start uh, planning with a wise way all new roads, all housing, what we are doing right now. So it won't happen in one or five or ten years. It will take time. So, I mean, enormous infrastructure spending is needed. Uh, how do we mobilize that if indeed we do want to to, to get this transition happening at scale and at speed. And I would say, you know, the, the urgency of climate change means that we do actually need to move quite urgently. Uh, and so, so, I mean, it's a question, I suppose, for Sharon or for Matthew. I mean, how, how, do you, how do you unlock that finance? Well, I think we've got to be very honest with everyone about how much it's going to cost. And we've got to mobilize those funds. But the good news is that I think there are funds available. Uh, just to quote some figures at you, I think we've got 70 billion available under the, um, under the European Fund for Strategic Investments, of which 40 billion is aimed at low emission mobility, and 12 billion for uh, low carbon and sustainable urban uh, uh, mobility alone. Um, and indeed, uh, we've got, if you think about the research side, which is crucial, another 7 billion identified under the Horizon 2020 program for low carbon mobility. We're going to need every drop of that money, though. It's going to be extremely expensive and indeed to deal with some of the social impacts. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I don't think we know how quickly jobs are going to change as, or indeed be supplanted. And we've got to be ready to spend some money to make sure that it's not just the least advantage in our societies who, who pay the, the cost of change. So on that note, thank you very much to everyone. I think it's clear that there's going to be very um, large-scale transitions happening in this sector uh, in the coming decades. There, there's some question over the speed and the scale and the sort of how we're going to mitigate some of the social effects that might come about, but I, I think it's been a very enlightening discussion, so please join me in uh, thanking the panel. Thank you. Thank you.